The idea of a siege is almost as old as human history. It has been about as long as people have waged war on each other and tried to use every method they possibly could to defeat their opponents. The general idea is that it's always the same. Keep your enemies secured inside of their town or city, block all the exits, and then wait them out. We can look at the siege of Leningrad in World War II, where over the course of about two years, more than half a million soldiers on each side in the freezing conditions and the brutal fighting before the Red Army prevailed. But the civilians suffered as well. With more than a million dying to either violence or lack of food, this marked the ultimate failure of Operation Barbosa and left the Axis forces fighting a war on two fronts for multiple years, stretching their resources and contributing massively to their defeat. And while we can look back through history and pick out many other examples, Jerusalem during the Crusades, the Trojan War, there is particularly a strange example that is said to have occurred in France in the 1400s. What's odd about it is not how long it lasted, it isn't how many lives were lost, there wasn't some genius tactic or idea that managed to lift it, and there isn't going to be some hero that appears to rescue all the stricken civilians. It's the fact that the enemy, if the tales are to be believed, weren't human at all. This is the story of the Wolf Siege of Paris. France in the 1400s was, as many places in Europe were at the time, not an easy place for the average citizen to exist in. The seemingly endless cycles of unrest, war, hunger, and disease were ripping through with alarming regularity. Plague had swept through Paris in 1348 for the first time, and not for the last. It devastated the local population, killing many within their numbers, and it would return with alarming frequency over the years. Each passing iteration going through the local population and striking them down, man, woman, or youngling. In addition, there was a war in the region. A civil war had erupted in 1407 known as the war I'm about to brutalize, the Amangak burgundian War. That's probably right. And as with all campaigns waged by opposing factors, it was the local people that were just trying to live their lives that were caught in the middle. So how many people were living in Paris around this time? While the exact populations are difficult to track and verify with the same accuracy that we can nowadays, back in the 15th century, most contemporary sources agree that the population of Paris was around eh, in the 1420s, probably going to be about 100,000 people, and had ballooned up to somewhere in the region of 150,000 by the end of the century in 1500. Given that today's events take place in 1450, we'll assume that they were somewhere between these two population numbers living in Paris around the same time, when the long-suffering Parisians began to suffer from a new problem. A pack of wolves was said to stalk the areas not far outside the city walls, keeping mainly to the woods nearby. These beasts had been known to accost, attack, and then eat occasional lone travelers or merchants that happened to wander too far from the beaten path. The severe cold and lack of food for them at the time had made them hungrier and more desperate. They began to venture closer and closer to civilization and the major urban populations despite the risks that it held. With the freezing conditions limiting their normal food sources, they began to become more bold out of either desperation or necessity. And soon there were reports that the wolves had begun making entry into the city itself in order to find something to eat. They gained entry through the walls of the city that had been erected by King Philippe Auguste or Guste in the 13th century. These had fallen into disrepair in the intervening period, and the lack of maintenance meant that there were gaps in places to access, a route in for anyone or anything that was desperate enough to try. Known to the locals as simply Le Luz de Paris, or Paris, or the Wolves of Paris, stories began to spread amongst the residents. Wolves were spotted on the streets and lurking in the shadows. They snatched up unwary people and dragged them off. They attacked and killed indiscriminately. Wolves are generally wary of humans and are not by their nature man-killers in most circumstances. However, they had been known to eat human flesh, usually if it had been on like a dead body. There were many reports throughout history of packs of wolves scouring battlefields and ripping the flesh from the fallen. Some think that the wolves, desperate due to hunger, were scavenging the dead bodies of many plague victims that were dumped outside the city walls. And gradually they gained a taste for human flesh, a combination of need, hunger, and desperation that led them beginning to make entry to the city itself and attack live prey to eat. The leader of the wolf pack was named Coutard by the citizens of Paris, roughly translating to Bobtail. He was an enormous specimen and brutal by all accounts, showing absolutely no fear and seemingly willing to engage with whoever came up against his pack, it meant that they could fill their bellies. The fear and worry grew amongst the local populace. Some reports stated that there were upwards of 40 victims of Coutard and his wolves, all killed and eaten. Eventually they decide to band together and come up with a plan to get rid of the pack of wolves once and for all. 
They waited until the entire pack had entered into the city through the walls before they gathered a group and lured them through the streets, enticing, teasing, and otherwise taunting them to bring Coutard and the other wolves to the marketplace outside of Notre Dame. There, a large contingent of Parisians were gathered and ambushed them. They attacked and killed the wolves with stones, sticks, and spears. And so ended the wolf siege of Paris, with more than 40 dead, but the four-legged evil killed, the citizens were free from the lurking terror. But how did this happen? There is some debate, as you might expect, about whether this incident happened either as described or at all. Taking the story at face value, there are some problems with it. The behavior of the wolves, as described, is highly unusual. They would normally take great pains to avoid highly populated areas due to the risk of being killed by humans. But these were not normal times. Food was scarce, and it had been known all throughout history that when required, wolves would expand their hunting grounds. It also should be noted that I think this was actually during like the Little Ice Age period, where it was colder than normal, which means there was less food than normal. Now, they would take risks that normally wolves wouldn't during this time period, and they would even seek out prey that they would usually not be a part of their typical meals. While portions of it read like a fable or fairy tale, especially the final battle between the citizens and the bloodthirsty beasts taking place in a town square, Vanquishing these demons under the shadow of Notre Dame, I mean, come on, it kind of just works. Some people believe it's possible there may still be some elements of truth, but maybe not exactly like as described. If nothing else, the story has survived relatively unchanged for six centuries, and with very few notable embellishments or changes. There's even a plaque in Paris to this day that stands as the supposed location of the standoff and tells the story. And it would be far from the first instance of wild animals attacking humans. As recent as World War II, there was a pitched battle ongoing between German and Russian forces that was unrelenting, brutal, and devastating as they come. But the two sides were being harassed by wolves constantly in the local area. This became such a problem that the two opposing armies in open and current war with each other agreed an impromptu ceasefire. For a brief spell of time, the bloodshed and death paused on each side and took time to hunt and kill these wolves, ridding themselves of the ongoing hassle. They soon went straight back to killing one another, but it's interesting to see that even during a modern war, armies equipped with the latest in life-taking technology can be forced to take a break with each other and deal with the brutality of Mother Nature. A more relevant example would also be the so-called beast or beast of Jevoudan. Uh, I actually covered this one, so if you're interested in it, you can go take a look. It's on this channel. But this was either a single animal or several that was wreaking havoc over the course of three years in Jevoudan region of France, starting in 1764. I also did another video on this, except this is on my main channel, called Where which is basically about a werewolf. So go check out Roanoke Gaming if you want to see that. But while there was never any definitive confirmation of what this beast was, many of the sightings and reports from witnesses compared it to very closely like it was a wolf. In fact, the very description of the encounter with de describing it was like a wolf, yet not a wolf. Honestly, I think it was like a very young lion, but that's just me. And its behavior was bold as Coutard, if not even more so. It would attack and kill either people that were alone or pairs of young offspring, usually killing and eating what was left. Despite being wounded and fought off many times, it persisted and reappeared in various places around the region. An official huntsman was sent out by the monarch at the time to deal with the beast, and although he took down a very large wolf, the killings continued. A second man was dispatched who confronted and eventually killed a similar sized animal, and it seems as though the killing stopped. By the time the remains had been transported back for examination, no official identification had could be made or anything, so, the only really remains of this are like the theories and guesses as to what the Beast of Jebudon actually looked like that took somewhere between 60 and 100 lives at the time. When it comes to the Wolf Siege of Paris, many of the questions asked are exactly how they began to take such reckless and risky visits to a populated city. Even in the face of low food levels and struggle, why such a risk for the most deadly of all prey available would be sought after? The main theory put forward about why the wolves became so aggressive and so brave is based around the climate at this time. With their natural prey and food sources being scarce and hard to come by, they began to scavenge the numerous dead bodies that were dumped outside of Paris. An added nuisance to this theory is that since these unfortunate people had died of the plague, their bodies would be tainted. Was it possible that multiple generations of wolves not only acquired a taste for human meat, but also ingested some of the lingering bacteria from the rotting corpses and began to develop side effects from them? Ones that lowered their inhibitions and robbed them of their sense of self-preservation, and ones that made them willing to basically risk it all to get more of the most dangerous of all food. 
Others would have us believe that the fable or fairy tale aspects and how they are to it are nothing more than proof of what it is. It's, it's nothing but just a made up or embellished story. One that brought people together with the fear and horror of what they were hearing and raised them up with the triumph defeat of an enemy at the end. It can't be denied that there are parts of the story that are a little too hard to believe, and there is something a little too cinematic about townsfolk all banding together and staging a last stand in such a historic location. But that alone doesn't prove that it didn't happen. The fact that the story has survived and the fact that it has been repeated in some ways over the intervening years should demonstrate that there is at least some merit to some aspect of it. There have been films made that are based around these sorts of ideas. While most immediately think of The Grey where Liam Neeson is stalked by an enormous wolf in the desolate snow-covered backwoods of Alaska, there is a slightly more obscure film that mirrors it a lot closer. A French film named Les Loups de Paris, Paris, I'm not French, released in 2001, maybe better known by its English name, The Brotherhood of the Wolf, set in the 18th century in France. It follows a tale of a mysterious and terrible beast that is terrorizing the area around Gévaudan and the efforts that they had to make to put this beast down. Looking into the details on the facts that remain about the Wolf Siege of Paris, it's easy to latch on to the lack of information. Sources survive, yes, but not in the same quantity or quality that would have for other events around this time or even before it. The green offspring of uh, the last video I did. Some questions whether such an incident or ongoing outrage would have generated enough buzz to have reached the ears and pens of more mainstream and trusted historians or chroniclers. However, it's easy to forget that in the 15th century, it was entirely possible for people to be unaware of all but the largest happenings, even just a few towns over. And in the end, as callous as it all sounds, the loss of 40 citizens to wolf attacks may not have been significant enough to merit passing along. Merchants and other frequent travelers would doubtfully have known or warned each other about others, sort of like the dangers of lone traveling within the woods outside of Paris. But this wasn't really new information either. There were always risks, not only from aggressive wildlife, but from bandits and others that would rob them. So it's kind of known that this area was dangerous. In an era where scores of people were dying to plague at a rate that was nothing short of alarming, hamstringing the struggling local populace, would the loss of like 40 lives have ever really been registered on anybody's radar? Probably not. How many of them could just be absolutely confirmed to be wolves in the first place either? I mean, there was really dangerous people out there as well. There is every chance that those away from Paris were unaware of what was allegedly happening. Equally, there is a chance that once the story and the legend grew within the population, every person that went missing or failed to appear was simply assumed to have been taken and eaten by wolves. To look at it through the most critical lens possible, how accurate do we really think the number of 40 dead is likely to have been? And more importantly, what sort of proof do we have that this was, in fact, taken by Cotard and his roving band of bloodthirsty wolves? Ernest Thompson set and wrote mainly about wolves in 1937 and includes a chapter on the infamous ringleader of the Wolf Siege of Paris. Here's how he describes him. This is a story of the great Qatar, the King Wolf, the wolf that ruled all central France like a ferocious despotic monarch. The wolf that drove a thousand men in flight before him. The wolf that shut up all Paris in a state of a siege for three hard years of snow. The wolf that sent King Charles into Poltron hiding behind his castle walls of stone. The wolf that every day devoured a man as a dog might maul his daily ration bone. Guitard himself seemed to have achieved legendary status. A wolf described by most as almost impossibly large, brave, and also showing a lot of cruelty. It is possible to look at the whole situation and wonder how much has grown over the years as the story has retold. I mean, ask a fisherman about a fish. Equally, regardless of what animal experts or critical observers have to say, the fact does remain that this story has survived in a collective consciousness for multiple centuries. There are references to it from time to time throughout the intervening years, and the fact that the powers that be chose to commemorate the incident with a plaque, a plaque on the Notre Dame building no less, which I don't know if it's still there now, proves that even if we were to believe that it was either a grossly exaggerated or embellished event, it almost doesn't matter. Even the most skeptical would have to agree that there must have been wolves in the area at the time that attacked and killed and ate people. The most critical would have to concede that there must be at least a kernel of truth to the matter. And is that not alone scary enough? Even in our most modern minds, the idea that a carnivorous pack of beasts is looming somewhere in the darkness within our city walls, ready to snatch us up, claws and teeth, and shuffle us off our mortal coil is oddly terrifying. 
You don't want to be food for something else. How much more so for the people in 1450? Even if Qatard was nothing more than a 15th century boogeyman to make offspring stay close to their parents, a product of exaggeration and hype, there is no doubt that if you were walking the streets in Paris in the 1400s, you would probably do well to keep at least half an eye on the shadows around you. But anyhow, I want to thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed, then leave a like would be great. A view as it gets it out there. And subscribing is a great way to tip today on when I post. If you have any suggestions, I'm always open for them. Let me know down in the comments and I will try to check those out. Uh, I want to thank my patrons real quick for their patronage. At the Literal Wendigo tier, we have Grayson West. Thank you, sir. At the Eyewitness to the Event tier, we have Beaver Malaga and Mushroom Dance. At the First Hand Accounts tier, we have Cody Cherry Drake, Cannon Johnson, Fred Rush, Troy, Elise Alcorn at the Creator Stories tier, uh, along with Keegan Ekinsviller and Jamie Patterson, as well as June Pie, Samantha Johnson, Scott Preston, and the final girl on the left, as well as Sean Wilson. Yeah, stumbled through that. Anyways, uh, it's the day after Thanksgiving. It, yeah, I'm, I'm stumbling a little bit. But thank you guys for listening. I hope you enjoyed, and I will see y'all in the next one.